Leo, um, obviously in the last 12 months, we've been forced into a situation where we have to embrace a different way of working. And because we're forced into it doesn't necessarily mean that we have freedom of choice. And I think perhaps what has taught us in the last 12, uh, 12 months is that it's the freedom of choice that most people probably crave. And everyone's circumstances are different. You know, you touched on the idea that if you've got an office in your house, then that's where you'd like to work. Well, that's great. But because you've got the space doesn't mean it's still the right environment for you. Um, who knows what other things you've got going on in your house at the time that would allow you to actually focus. Um, that's probably more, me more speaking about myself, actually, than uh, perhaps others. Um, I think as well, uh, depending on the stage of your career and, and what you actually do in terms of your focused work, um, that can have a big influence on it. If, if you're responsible for managing multiple people, then you want to be there uh, to, to, to get a feel for how your staff are, are getting on. But with that, I imagine if you're in a, a, an office environment, your ability to focus on tasks might become more difficult. So you actually find that when you're at home, perhaps you're getting more focused work done. And it's more about collaboration and management when you're in the office. Um, that might not be the case for everyone. Like I said, there may be a, a large portion of people that feel that the, the work or the office environment um, is, is a, a place where they can go to carry out tasks that, that give them the solitude. Um, I think as well, another thing that, that can't be ignored is that for years we've been talking about a work-life balance and that's, that's vital, it's really important. Um, but everybody views their, their, their work differently. You know, some people are very career driven and you know, they, they, they crave the idea of being able to, to take their work home with them, probably to the detriment of their health in many respects. But equally, there's a lot of people that realize work is for the office. And when I go home, that's my place of solitude. That's my family time. I want to be able to relax when I'm there. Um, and one of the things I've thought about recently is that I keep hearing people talk about uh, that wanting to go back to, to gyms when they reopen and the ability to actually get in somewhere and work out. And it comes down to a couple of things when they see it. It seems to be, well, I don't have the, the facilities at home to, to work out properly. Well, that's the same for, for some people in terms of using an office. They don't have the facilities at home in order to work properly. And also they don't have the motivation. Well, I think as well, if, if you are at home and you relax, you don't want to spoil that. You don't want to be sitting in your kitchen at your, your breakfast table, having your breakfast to then start your work, to then have your lunch at your breakfast or your, at your table in your kitchen and then your dinner. Um, it, it, it's, not, it's not a healthy scenario, actually. You need the ability to switch off and it's, it's the same as everyone needing a holiday and the ability to, to, to relax. Um, and I think that where we're getting to now is that we have a, a home environment that is conducive to allow us to work when it suits us and give us, gives us the flexibility that we need, but also having a work environment that provides a, a sort of facility that, that isn't mimicked, that doesn't mimic the home entirely, but offers you certain aspects of the home where you can collaborate and relax at work, but also have space that gives you a degree of solitude that you may not get at home. And, and I'm sure Hazel will have a lot to say about that in terms of, of design and, and, and what sort of spaces perhaps the office should create. Now, um, I think it, another thing as well is that employers are probably starting to, to appreciate now that when they have their staff visible, it's not about presenteeism and keeping, a, keeping an eye on them. It's actually about getting an understanding for their personalities and what their needs are. And that's a lot harder to do over, over a video call. And, and I think that the, the, the home versus the office idea uh, isn't actually the question. It, it, it remains to be, what, does, what, is, what's, what do we need from our offices in order to continue working where we want to? And what flexibility can we create that gives people the right balance that, that creates happiness? Yeah, well, my dream of having a sofa for a nap in the office finally might come true. <laughs> Hazel, what, uh, what, what have you noticed in terms of uh, requirements from users, from your clients? What are you being asked now to produce? What kind of experience are you thinking of creating? So I don't know if it's changed completely what we're being asked now to what we were being asked like 12 years ago. It's just evolved a whole lot quicker. So we are in this virtual world. I mean, if we think back 12 months ago, how many of us were on Teams and using it on a hourly basis? 
we were all a bit scared of it um, and not using it. But now it's just part of our day to day tool. It's, it's kind of built in. So I think we've just, it's evolved a wee bit quicker than it was going to before, which I think is for the benefit of everyone, to be honest. Um, after that initial kind of short term reaction to putting up plastic screens in between desks in the office and making sure people were two metre distance from each other. Clients are now asking us to look at, I guess, what can't you do from home? So mm -hmm. um, having done surveys and things with the staff, it's looking like we'll be modelling kind of utilisation on a kind of three day a week in the office. Um, and what will be people be coming into the office to do? So it won't need to be focused work. It's, it's things like um, team building, it's face-to-face -face kind of one-to-one -one performance reviews or just mentoring, et cetera. Um, sprint sessions, project design collaboration as a designer. And I guess there's a lot of designers out there, so shout out. Um, but we're finding it really, really hard to design at the moment. Over online, we're using tools like Whiteboard. Um, we're using our hands a lot. We're using video conference calls and stuff, but nothing beats just being around a table with a set of pens, paper everywhere, scribbling away, printing some precedents out and things like that. So as designers, we're missing that. And I guess that's one thing to know. It's going to be completely different depending on what you do, um, what sector you're in, whether you're a designer, architect, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're in investment, and everyone will need to suit differently. And then within those companies, there's even more. So we're finding that the kind of more technical staff, technicians, technologists, they're quite happy just being in their own space at the moment. They're focused work. They know what they're doing. They can touch base with the team at the start of the day, and then they've got their tasks for the day. Whereas the designers, we're finding it's a lot harder. Introverts as well. They like being on their own a bit more and having their focus time. Extroverts like me, I need to be out there seeing people. So I'm finding it a lot more difficult. So it will not be a one size fits all. Um, in terms of what companies are expecting from their spaces, flexibility, adaptability, kind of one of the key things. Um, from space, so from our kind of um, occupier clients our, that we work with every day, we're asked, we've been asked for flexibility in space, but also the people who are using, the end users are wanting flexibility in their work pattern. So it's not just a nine to five, three days a week, it's just to suit nursery drop-offs, etc. cetera. Um, just working around their, their lives. And I think we've been allowed that. Um, we're being asked, and Peter, you can talk on this a bit more perhaps, the, the kind of data driven. So um, people and uh, occupiers will want the most out of their space. They're, a lot of it's property consolidation at the moment, um, just because of the market, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. You can probably comment on that a bit better, but making sure that there's the kind of um, facilities in place that we can check on a day-to-day -day basis how space is being used, um, where it's being used and how they can continue to adapt because this is we're jumping into the unknown. Um, when people are in the office, it'll be a curated experience. We'll all be moving fast. If you're in three days a week, you'll want to fit as much into those three days as possible with your colleagues. So where are my colleagues? Where's my project team? Oh no, I forgot my cable. Where do I get that extra cable from? I need my headset, all that. So it'll need to be a kind of well curated experience. And I think a lot of the kind of company costs will be focused towards um, that kind of service and making the kind of office as a service as well as this office as space. And then all these other things that we're just becoming a bit more aware of because we've been on our own for a bit longer. So sustainability, uh, wellness, uh, looking after ourselves, universal design. So we're being asked to kind of weave that into any design that we're doing at the moment as well. Uh, Peter, uh, I heard people leaving Zoom on all day so that they could ensure collaboration with their colleagues from home. Is there any better tricks we can use? Is there new technology coming up that's going to support collaboration from team members that can't be at the office just now or in the future won't be able to do to be in the office all day, every day? Yeah, there, there is. Um, and one of the things that we shouldn't forget um, with this is we've learned a lot um, in terms of how we can collaborate virtually. Okay, now that, that can also help us in terms of reducing, if you like, our carbon emissions, if you like, as people. 
Um, so, so, we'll, so we can actually carry out work, you know, globally now, and we can actually collaborate globally. Um, so whether you do that in the house or at home, um, you know, that's irrelevant. What we've found is that the technology has been proven to be, to be something that we can do, if you like, project collaboration with. And one of the things that, that we have found quite interesting is the amount of time I'll personally have been asked to do presentations um, to various companies and to my colleagues. Um, so I've never actually spoken as much to my US colleagues as I, as I, as I, have, as I do now um, and actually present to them. I'm helping out my London team. Um, and present to some of their clients and some of the topics that they were interested in. And as Hazel mentioned, some things like smart technology um, is something that's coming in and it's a big, big thing. That's, and what it does is it can analyse the patterns uh, in the buildings in terms of how people move around the buildings. It's not just where they are, but how they move, you know, what direction they move. You can identify congestion in spaces. So you can see if there's like, um, you know, in terms of improvements in flexibility. Um, you know, all of these things are now, you know, something that's came to the fore because we're actually now using technology, you know, more, even more often now than we used to. We used to have, have our phones, you know, and that was our, our connection to the, to, to the world, if you like, the phones and our laptops during the day. But now we're sitting here all day, every day, you know, on calls, Zoom calls, Teams calls. And one of the things that, 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 that we've seen, um, or I, we, we've seen in our office, I mean, we did a survey three weeks into lockdown. Uh, sorry, three months into lockdown, just to see how everyone was feeling. Now, everybody was enjoying it, right? So, well, two thirds were enjoying it. Um, they, they thought it was great fun. We did the same survey uh, in December and it flipped. So two thirds wanted, they needed the office. Actually, it wasn't a, it became a, a necessity um, because they were, uh, they were fed up. I've moved three times in my house. I've moved into different rooms because I'm sick of looking at the same walls because I don't get out. Because, you know, we're, we're stuck here. We can't actually, we used to go, in, when we're in town, we used to go, you know, to a shop at lunchtime or go to a cafe, have a, a, you know, go out for lunch. Now, I'm not allowed to go out for lunch. I'm not even allowed to go out and sit in a coffee shop, right? So all of these kinds of things we, 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 we need to consider when we get back to, to the workplace um, in terms of our, if you like, access to amenities. Um, and that's why, so we position our buildings and our workplaces um, to be local to amenities, to help those businesses. Um, our houses are not positioned very well to, for access to amenities. Um, so that's a big thing. I know I've drifted off topic, but these are the kinds of things that they go through my mind. Uh, getting back to the technology side of things, I think, as I say, one of the big things for me is the increased, I feel like, capacity to access specialists within your own business has been really useful, um, to be honest, and the opportunity to, to actually provide some focus time with our clients because we can sometimes find that half hour or hour to go over a subject, to go over a presentation that we might have found more difficult if our, say our clients are in London. You know, you can't just hop on a plane and just jump down that day, but you can actually jump on a Teams and do the presentation, show them how it works because everyone is more familiar with it. But what we should remember is, is that the workplace is somewhere to work. The home is somewhere to rest and relax, and we can't forget that. Focus work we could do in the house, right? But proper kind of, if you like, knowledge knowledge sharing um, mm -hmm. and training, we have found it very difficult um, as a business to actually ensure that that works. And more importantly, culture. Culture is very difficult to impart uh, via these lovely four screens as I've got. Um, you know, you just can't, you can't do it. We, we, we try our best. We're doing weekly kind of presentations to our team to try and to do that as well. So again, from a technology perspective, we're trying to do our best, but nothing can beat, you know, that, that, inter that interaction, you know, that kind of, you know, charging up the office as I do and going, right, what are we doing? Getting people energised. You know, you can't, you can't really do that. It's really difficult to do in teams. You can't just, you know, grab things on the screen. So again, I know that was talking about technology there, but I think I think that's I've tried to express myself as as much as I could because I will go off topic when you ask me a question. So okay. you uh, you you said that like technology has obviously enabled us to be uh, able to collaborate and 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 things like Teams and Zoom and, and all that mm -hmm. give us that interface. In the past, when people got mobile phones in business, they're glued to their ears and. Really cool people had the, 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 the Bluetooth and all that. It was oh, great. That's, that's and, um, and then uh, we, we moved on and it was Blackberries and, and people were accessible and they were addicted to them. You know, I was one of them. You just you can put it down. Do you think there's a danger now then that if people are working from home and we've got likes of Teams and Zoom that they're perceived to be always accessible? 
and then there's not a switch off point. I totally agree with you, Michael. And I, and I think that's why I'm saying that, that, that what we'll see is, is that the team sessions will actually be something that we'll probably do in the workplace. So we'll probably have more, kind of, and again, some of the clients that we're working with are looking at more focused spaces where they can actually carry out these discussions because they've seen the benefit from working from home, yeah. right? Um, so they'll do that when they go back into the office as well. Um, but what, what we've got to remember is, is that, you know, not everyone has high-speed data connections as well. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the big challenges we've had. Not everyone's got high-speed data connections. Not everyone, um, you know, enjoys sitting in the house, you know, 24 hours a day, you know, especially kind of young young professionals. Yeah. You know, so there's a, there is that, that kind of social side. Mm -hmm. the, the, in terms of the clients, you're, you're right. Clients feel as if they've got, they'll, they'll own you for potentially 24 hours. No, you, Michael, you're a good I was going to say, yeah, I, got, I, got, I don't see how you can put a negative spin on that, Peter. <laughs> no, not you, <laughs> right? But, but in terms of some, some clients are, you know, as you're almost at the beck and call. The other yeah. thing is, is at the moment, we, we, we almost have like an inbuilt fear to go on holiday, right? Because yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, we have yeah, to take time yeah. off. Because mm -hmm. everybody thinks, oh, what are you doing? I mean, I've had clients, when I, I tried to take holidays last year, which was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I had times when um, clients would say to me, um, you know what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm just going to go away for the screen for a day. I hope. No, can can you can you meet with me? Well, I could meet with you, but it'd be good to get away for the screen. And yeah. it, so again, I'm hoping that even that the workplace can act as a, if you like, a social a barrier, if you like. Um, so so that it allows us then, if you like, to. It's a corporate deal. Hey, this is what we're doing. So, yeah, so, so basically, as, as it emerges from this leader chat, is there's going to be a new way of working where it's much more flexible. If you want to stay home and you can start to do a home, your home. If you want to go to the office, you go office, which means basically, Hazel, that companies won't need those large spaces anymore. Will they? Is there a change of requirements there for spaces? Are the big offices going to shrink? What are we doing with the properties? Is uh, Can we reinvent them or do we need to move somewhere else? Or have you noticed any themes on the, on the tr any trends on this side of things? Yeah, I definitely think there's, well, from what we're seeing, a consolidation of property um, amongst the kind of larger corporates. So, um, looking at reducing their space and subletting that to monetize it. And I guess that's a sign of the uncertain economy that we're in at the moment. Um, and the fact that I think quite, there will be a percentage of people working from home at least what, three days a week. So it doesn't make sense to keep all that. Um, that space as well will be a bit more activity based. Um, so I think it's not the rows and rows of open plan desking anymore. It is a good variety of kind of quality space. So there is opportunity to use different types of property. Um, it doesn't have to be the kind of brand new build. Sorry, Michael, this is maybe a bit off your <laughs> brand new build. But there'll be opportunity to use all these different types of spaces. I think um, there's a lot of chat about hub and space. Spoke. Um, and I listened to a BCO webinar, I think it was about six months ago, and there was a big focus on that, the hub being the kind of headquarters, the main office space in the city centre, a bit more urban, uh, where it's a bit more events based, it's where mm -hmm. we've got the full complement of offer. But then actually there's this other network of spaces, the spokes that are a bit more localised, um, a bit more... Um, I guess, uh, um, like using retail spaces, for example. So we're we're seeing some of our clients using their above their banks as hub spaces in the likes of Falkirk and Bigger, etc. I'm just not sure, quite sure how that uh, concept that the BCO were talking about translates to here in Scotland, because I don't think I would go to my local Bigger. Uh, branch to kind of work there in a hub um, because I don't know if there'd be many people from my organization there so it's a different scale of economy and I'd be interested to hear out there if, if they think um, that that is translatable to, to Scotland the kind of hub and spoke model. Um, Peter we've got Stephen here asking um, about rural 
So talk, I, I work from a farm in the countryside in Scotland, and luckily I got fiber optic installed during lockdown number one, which actually saved my life. So Stephen is asking, do you think it's feasible to consider offices of the future more in a rural location to bring a new way for both work well-being and personal well-being? I'm asking you because you just mentioned about yeah. offices being somewhere that have got access access to you know the shops and cafes and stuff like that. What about going in the middle of the countryside instead? Yeah, it's it's an interesting uh, model actually, Sarah, because one of the clients we were working with wanted to change their entire. This wasn't through COVID. This was actually about sustainability and carbon emissions. And what they were going to do is they were they wanted to analyse their staff, right? So I'll come back to that in a second, but this is an interesting point. They were going to analyse their staff and actually identify what the best location would be for their office rather than putting in the city centre. Um, so, so that was an interesting concept. But again, that could lead to people being out, if you like, in rural um, you know, locations. Now, one of the challenges, again, it, it depends on, again, the type of work that someone is carrying out, you know, in that, in that, that space. Um, if it is a collaborative working, you know, like, um, you know, like the, all of us, you know, we're all collaborators. Um, so we, we like to get together and share ideas. It, it can be challenging. I mean, we, we did a, a, a week, if you like, in trying to do, uh, they called it a sprint, a design sprint uh, on a project recently. So, uh, this was the first virtual design sprint I've been on. I've been on kind of virtual, I've uh, been on real kind of design sprints where everyone's together. And it was quite challenging, very challenging to actually kind of communicate your ideas. The other thing is, is with body language, you can actually see how people can, can see when someone's wanting to talk. Sometimes it's quite difficult on teams. So you end up with people cutting across each other. Then you go, right, we'll do the hands thing. So somebody's hands been sitting there for 10 minutes and they don't get a chance to talk. So, you know, so collaboration is still an issue. So I think... For that, for 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 um, for that that individual that, that's in the house and getting the broadband, it's great, but it's also got to be tailored to what they do for a living. You know, is it is it collaborative type work? Is it solo work? Um, you know, for example, an example of a solo worker that, that we have been we've been working with Microsoft at the moment, and they've got game you know the, the games designers right now. I'm not going to say this about everybody, but um, Games designers traditionally are quite introverted. They like to be kind of focused and in the cave, if you like, and getting stuck into to what they do. But they, they want to go even back. They want to go back to the office. They don't want to be sitting in. And that's game. That's people. That's games developers. That would be the last people that I would have thought. They, they'd be, I thought they'd be happy, you know, sitting at home and working all day. But again, that's their avenue to access and kind of the social side of life, you know, as well. Um, and again, I don't know if I'd want to be sitting personally, but like Hazel, I'm quite extroverted. I don't know whether or not I'd want to stay in the house 24 hours a day, phone up Amazon to get my food and actually not actually have social interaction. So I think it's key for social interaction um, more than just how you do work. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think hopefully that answers that question. Um, um. Michael, I think you are our property mogul here, so you can answer Alan's question. Alan is asking, do you not think that we will be back to full-time office working a bit with a less suspicious view on home working sooner than we all think? Investors, retail and hospitality operators will put pressure on politicians and large companies to support city centers. After all, a lot of our pension are invested in city center properties. I think that's a good point. Uh, I mean, at the moment, um, whilst we may feel there's light at the end of the tunnel, I completely think that there is, uh, there's a, an element of knee-jerk reaction, you know, the obvious point of people saying, well, we're, we're going to try and make our staff work from home. And, it, and, I'm, and I mean make them, not ask them. That's not about necessarily seeing what's best for them. It's about saving money. And, and that's not the right answer either. Um, there's loads of funds that obviously have... Uh, Lights of pension funds have been mentioned have uh, money tied up in, in these these uh, big assets and they need to, to create revenue. Will there be lobbying to government? You better believe it. Of course there will. There always is. Um, I think that what will probably happen is that there'll be a, a, a bit of time that will go past. People will start to, to relax in general and we'll get a bit more of a balance. Uh, I personally feel that in terms of the space allocation in the past, there's been, a, and, and we're, we're guilty of it as well, thinking it was the right thing to focus on occupational density. 
in trying to drive that down and therefore think you're being very, very efficient. And in many respects at the time that was correct, but now obviously with COVID and people being concerned about pathogens and diseases and things, rightly so, we have to think about space and how much space is utilised and what that environment is like. Um, if you go back, I don't know, to Victorian times, there would have been big offices with huge, huge windows that were openable because they were probably more aware of infectious diseases back then because they didn't have the method to, to fight them with uh, uh, you know, inoculations, etc. Can we go back to that? I think there's a good chance that design will, will start to, to, to catch up again and we'll, we'll start to utilise ventilation technology like Peter touched on earlier and have spaces that, that Hazel had mentioned that are, are, are slightly different to how we occupy now. The idea of someone being in an a, a open plan office where it's rows upon rows of desks, I think those days are probably in the past and rightly so because you know it, it doesn't really reflect what people want and need. And I think that that goes for well-being in general, you know, well-being at home. It's important that your work doesn't start to influence your health because it's going home with you. But equally, you want the ability to be at work and have the conditions that don't exactly mimic home, but give you enough relaxation and space that you don't feel that you're compromising in your health. Yeah. Can I just pick up on that, Sarah? Because the interesting point about getting back to the, the workplace is this aspect of reducing people's potential anxiety. Because mm. I think that that's the thing. So people are actually, I mean, I know our staff are, they're a wee bit worried. So what are we going to do? How is it going to work? Mm. Right now, some of the, I was going to touch on a bit of the technology because one of the things that we see in terms of how it could go forward, if you like, um, is some of the technology side of things. Um, so we, we're doing work with both Michael and Hazel in terms of implement some of this um, smart, smart technology. And what that does is it can actually identify, you know, where, where people are and who they've been in contact with. And it can also be anonymized, so we don't have this whole data protection challenge. Um, so, so, that, so there is a bit the ability to actually kind of track and trace internally. Now, the the, the idea is there's a, there's a number of elements here. So, dealing with this aspect of property, right? So, we've got new buildings with this technology going on, right? So, things like um, you know, and um, touch-free movement, so you can enter a building, right, with uh, with your if you like your phone, which has got a Bluetooth signal on it then that can be a virtual concierge. So you're not having people, if you like. So that will then allow you then access to your barriers because you've already pre-signed up. Your, if you like, the person that you're meeting has been notified that you've arrived. Okay, so they can come and meet you or you can wait for them to come up the stair. So then you'll go through the next stage past the turnstile and into the lift, right? And the lift will be automatically called because it will know again through the profile where you're going, right? So then you go up in the lift, you know, and then you go up to your, the, the office space. You approach the doors, the doors can automatically open because it's got wireless access control. So then you're into the meet, you're into the space, and the person that's going to meet you, who has arranged to meet you, right, can take you to the office space and the meeting room. So you go to the meeting room, and then the meeting room actually knows that you're there, right? And it can actually send you a signal and say, would you like a coffee? And the coffee machine could go off in the background and make the coffee. You can say, right, I'd like a cappuccino on the button. So again, limiting, if you like, contact. All of this technology exists. Yeah. Um, so, so this is the thing. So it's reducing contact, Right, and then in the event there are breakouts, if you like, of something, you can identify with how, who's been in contact and how long they've been in contact with that individual, and then then you can say, right, by the way, you should stay home. What you'll probably see, in my view, right, this is not the, the world's view, but my view is we'll see seasonal changes in office space use, mm -hmm. so we'll be more conscious of things like flus or the ongoing COVID, right, and what we'll do is we'll probably occupy the the, the actual offices less in the winter and increase that occupancy level, if you like, or decrease the occupancy of the spaces in the winter. But again, in the, in the summer, when we can actually open, potentially open the windows, because mm -hmm. bear in mind, everybody thinks natural ventilation is a great idea. I'll tell you what, see when it's zero degrees outside, <laughs> I'm not opening a window, right? So so this is one of the things you've got, you're going to have. So you want the ability to purge spaces and to, to clean the air, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's the kind of thing as well that, that's coming in. So you'll probably see technology, we're doing this with Microsoft, which actually analyzes the air and looks at contaminants in the air. Um, and, that, and again, that could be something that, that could be used in the future. It's mainly things like CO2 at the moment, but what we're looking to do is to see if there's other ways that we can identify uh, pathogens and things like that uh, in the future. 
Okay, so while you're talking about smart technology, Andre is asking, with the use of smart technology, do you think that there, ma there may be more of an adoption of people looking at wellness in the built environment to attract new tenants and lure back existing ones? Yes, yes, definitely. I think the if this is the challenge of the existing space and the new space, I think we're going to see, because if the new spaces are facilitated with increased ventilation rates because this is one of the things that we've seen in offices so we're going up higher you know we're going up another sort of 25 percent increased ventilation so what we're doing is, is we're cleaning the air more i feel like whereas some of the existing and older buildings are not um so they're down at the lowest levels you know in some cases some of the existing buildings could be half of the ventilation rates we're looking at in new buildings mm -hmm. um and, and the whole point of i feel like reducing contamination in office spaces is increased volumes of air right that's what needs to be done to help it it doesn't eliminate covid so uh, because you've still got all the surfaces remember covid goes on surfaces everybody thinks that it's the ventilation that's the issue but uh, the amount that you see a lot of people you know coming in touching a surface and then they'll touch their face i mean that that's that's it that's it passed on whether, so it's, whether it's covid or a cold or the flu is the same yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's no coincidence that flu rates have plummeted while we've all been in lockdown. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and what you'll see is, is that employers um, will look at that kind of productivity values and they'll start to analyse the best patterns of use for their buildings. Um, and that's what could happen. One of the other things that, that, that we're looking at is, as well as is, is that spreading, you might end up with offices not being 95, you might end up spreading if you like the, the office day, people would like to work earlier in the day, mm -hmm. and people who work later in the day. Um, so you might see that the office days spreading um, and that yeah. to, re keep, to reduce, if you like, the, the, the occupancy levels, not reducing the total space needed, believe it or not, mm -hmm. but it's more to reduce the actual, you know, uh, you know, one to six call centres. I mean, I don't know how they're, I mean, that's going to be kind of even less than that, one in three in a call centre. You know, trying to occupy spaces like that and trying to keep things spread from spreading is going to be a challenge. And as I say, the big thing that, that I don't know has been mentioned enough, but the anxiety of individuals coming back into the office space, you know, they're sitting there and then there's someone right next to them. Yeah. There's someone right next to them. You know, that's the kind of thing that, 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 you, you, that you would see. So I think what you end up with is similar size spaces, but less densely occupied. Mm -hmm. um, and spaces with technology that I understand, like what Hazel's doing, because Hazel's, they're, Hazel's going into a, a bit of an unknown, you know, they're, they're, they're designing spaces from an interior design perspective. But we don't know how people are going to really use, but the technology will tell and provide the feedback and the data to say that space has been used. This is how many people have been using that space. Mm -hmm. This is when it's used. This is how often it's used, right? You'll be able to identify that. And that way, from an ad adaption perspective, you'll have the data to allow you to adapt the spaces. Um, and that, that's also important from a smart, if you like, perspective. So hopefully there's a long, long-winded answer again there, Sarah, but hopefully <laughs> You like a chat, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, Alan is asking, do the panelists think the production rate in terms of quality and productivity for their employees' workloads have increased or decreased since working from home has come into place? I'm asking you because this is, we touched this in the chats we had before this event. Mm. Um, I, I think... Obviously, you can't speak for everyone. You can only speak through your own experiences. We we found with our project teams that when lockdown occurred, people people knuckled down and they they embraced it, if that's the right phrase, and really put their shoulder to the wheel. And productivity wasn't an issue. Um, after maybe three months, I think we we experienced issues where. Um, not so much mistakes were made, but we maybe ended up going over the same ground again because everyone makes assumptions that everyone knows what's going on. If we'd been in a meeting room, you could just open a drawing, you could mark it up, and it was all straightforward. Those opportunities are gone, and, and Peter sort of touched on it. So we maybe started to find that our, our, our rate of progress had slowed down some. Um, I also think that people uh, liked the novelty at the beginning. Uh, you know, Peter was talking about this. The, the survey they did in Atelier 10. And after a while, that, that novelty obviously wears off. Um, I think the idea of presenteeism, people turn up to work when they're ill, those days are thankfully going to be in the past. Uh, but what you don't get by working from home that you really need is if, you're, 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 uh, if you're an employer or employee is the ability to develop trust. And I don't mean trust for people to go on with their work and yet, yeah, 
you know, no one's, no one's um, uh, swinging a lead or whatever and, and, and not actually getting on with it. It's more a case of if you understand someone's per- personality and how they conduct themselves, whether just o- sort of overhearing how they conduct themselves on the phone or through emails, you start to get a measure of their personality. And with that, you develop a, a personal trust with them. And that's really difficult to do. If you've joined a new organisation the last 12 months, how do you embrace the, the brand culture and understand what people's different personalities are like? And therefore able to, the, to, to develop that degree of trust. So um, I think that productivity probably will have gone down slightly now. I think that it will be peaks and troughs. There's probably a few days of the week where people are, you know, absolutely soaring. And then there'll maybe be a couple of days where there's a few things have maybe just interfered with the general progress of their work, maybe from home, and, and it's and it's tailed off. That probably doesn't matter in the whole if you're if you're accelerating in one day and, and, and dipping on the other. Um, but you know, the, I think it's it's having the the freedom of choice to create your own balance that works for you and for your employer. Right, um, Ezo, let's get back to you for a bit. Talk about specifiers. Flair is asking, and I think this is a question that is quite <laughs> interesting for a lot of the people logged in today. Flair is asking, salespeople historically rely on meeting with you guys uh, to present products and discuss projects and blah, blah. How do you see the future role and the way they interact with specifiers when office time is more fluid? How can these salespeople best serve your needs? Basically, how can I sell anything to you while you're at home and I can, can come and see you? Um, we Well, over the past year, we have felt that there's been a wee bit of a gap. We've obviously got the people that we talk to the most and with just the casual phone calls and things, but it's those new products uh, have changed, etc. So that's where it's maybe a wee bit harder to connect. So Rachel in our office has started setting up a kind of Monday afternoon, five o'clock slot for all our interior designers. And then people who get in touch, we say, come along for half an hour and show us your new I don't, product or show us something different um, or tell us a bit of research that you've been learning about so we're kind of putting that opportunity out there as a practice because we know it's it's crucial to what we do as interior designers knowing what's out there um, it's part of our culture as well we want to be inspired by by you all and the new products out there so um, we find it it needs to be part of our our um, business and our culture so we're making the time for it um, and there's probably quite a lot of other designers out there doing similar so also we do, um, because it's something you, you touched very quickly earlier on how things have gone much faster in the last 12 months and trends have come into place faster. Tim is asking, uh, I started working in the office interior sector back in the late 80s and we work with Unisys and IBM on technology and the office. One of the things they said back then was workers would work more short-term contracts and work in local hub offices and travel to work HQ when needed. It has taken this long and a pandemic to get this far, which is a surprise. Do you think that future advances will happen quicker from here on? And what would they be, or do we need to rely on another pandemic for the next jump? Um, yeah, I, th- I think that it's, it's probably the pandemic that has jump started this, and that's there has been a, a great acceleration of things from technology to the way we work, to trust in the office culture, all these different things. So I definitely think that has been a good kick, I guess, into the future. Um, it, I, I, if it continues at this rate, I don't know where we'll be in the next <laughs> um, three years. So no, I don't think it, it's sustainable. Um, it is interesting, though, that that kind of local hub and HQ conversation again. And we are seeing a, a lot of that. Um, I think there was a co-working, which probably about, what, four years ago, co-working? Was it longer than that? Am I not? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Go working, etc., became a kind of big thing in the industry. Um, I think now after COVID, it's not going to be so much the traditional co workers there. I think corporates will probably be taking bits of co work space as part of their like full network of spaces. Um, we talked about um, retail spaces being used as well, those kind of secondary spaces um, away from the, the kind of main HQ workspace. Um, I heard the other day as well. 
Um, I was talking to Dave Bell at Bureau and he mentioned they're supporting a company called Breakout and it's basically all these rugby clubs and football clubs that aren't doing very well at the moment and um, not financially secure so they're offering their spaces out for co-working and I think Bureau are, are pairing with them to uh, get furniture into those spaces so that's another way of kind of localizing and supporting your community as well mm -hmm. so I thought that was a really interesting concept. Um, things like partnering with universities is another way that we can kind of um, strengthen that relationship with universities. We've been trying to do it for years and years and years, especially the BCO. Um, there's so much that we can learn either way, um, university like students to, to kind of corporates and vice versa. So this is a time to partner, whether we're using each other's spaces, whether mm -hmm. Events together, etc. It's just really there's so many opportunities that have come out of this as well, and I guess it's up to us and our occupier clients, etc., to kind of make the most of it and grab onto these opportunities. So, Michael, um, obviously, as uh, Asa was saying, things are moving and changing very fast. How do we make sure the buildings we are building now? will stand the test of the future challenges and trends and stuff like that. What tricks have you got in the bag to make sure you're investing your money well and then what you're investing today is going to make a profit rather than just create an extra cost 10 years down the line? Well, if I had any tricks, I'd be reluctant to share them, I think. I'd probably <laughs> give them to myself. Um, uh, look, I think it's, it's really difficult to, to know what's going to happen in three years' time, like Hazel said, let alone have an a in institutional investor that's, that's buying an asset with an income stream that's, that's planned for 15 years, and then with a lease event, try and think, how will this space now work and in, in, in meet the needs of, the, of the, 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 the occupiers at that stage? Um, what I think is good and is starting to change is there's a, a, an environmental and sustainable and governance uh, requirement that, you know, perhaps funds are starting to be more heavily regulated and also with shareholder pressure, starting to think about the, the ethical investment and whether it's worth actually investing in assets or not so much worth it, ensuring that they invest in ethical assets that uh, are carbon conscious and also think about long-term well-being of, of, of the planet and employees. And, and I think that that's, that's probably making a, a bit of an easier sell for the likes of, of companies like Abstract, where we're a traditional developer. So, you know, when we, we sell on a, an asset, we want it to have a positive legacy. But ultimately, when we speak to a fund, we're selling the income stream and the asset most of the time they're not necessarily thinking, well, how usable is this in 20 years time, 30 years time, in terms of its functionality or at that point, rather than, rather than on day one. Um, so I think that with, with fund managers coming in and looking at it, we're able to say, right, we've invested in certain aspects of the, the asset that will enable it to do certain things and have class uses changes and things like that in the future, um, even things like you know, if it's car, you've got multi-story car parks, how much car parking are we really going to need in the future? Is it going to change? Is it going to be autonomous vehicles? What will then happen to that car park? All of these questions, we don't have the answers to, but the fact that we're talking about it and thinking about it, if we come up with an idea and put it to a fund, it's a degree of risk mitigation for them to say, well, actually, okay, it's, it's going to cost more money, but it mitigates a... a, a, a a risk that will, will definitely be further down the line. And if it's a pension fund, that's important because that pension fund could be could be rolling for 30 years. So um, it's it's difficult because it's impossible to prove that it's worked until you get there. Mm. Um, Peter, Olivia is asking, going back to the the touch-free technology in the workplace, Olivia is asking, do you feel that with the incorporation of technology to create touch-free workplaces as described earlier, is this easier to achieve in new build schemes and whether there are any specific challenges with the refurb of the existing ones? And if so, what is the future of the vacant workspaces that are created? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's obviously easier um, in a new space because you can actually you know, plan for it. However, it doesn't mean that you can't do it in existing buildings. Um, there are large um, refurbishment projects that, that, that we are looking at um, where we can actually still implement things. So the, the smart tech, the track and trace, if you like, element of it, it's wireless. So all you really need to do is, is be able to connect it to light fittings. 
and you get your driver power supply, for example. Um, so, so in essence, most of this technology is wireless, so it's retrofitable, if you like, mm-hmm. um, in existing buildings. I think the biggest, the biggest challenge that you face um, with either new build or, if you like, refurbishment is actually identifying what you want it to do and how it's going to work within the space. So again, it's about understanding in an existing environment, it's about understanding how the tenants may perceive it and how they could use it. Because again, like any technology, um, it's about education and understanding and it takes time to bed these things in. But yes, you can do it in existing buildings and in new buildings. Thank you very much. That was a very concise answer you gave us. (laughs) Give you a little bit more, but... (laughs) <laughs> Azo, Judith is asking when there is a return to the office possibly we reduced attendance as people continue to work a percentage of time from home how do the panel see the layout of the office and provisional workspace for solo and collaborative working evolving um, well yeah I guess that's one of the debates out there at the moment that you'll go into the office and there'll only be collaboration spaces and there'll be nowhere to kind of focus. Um, I don't believe that because if I come into the office, I'm here for the day, it's quite a journey for me. So I need to be able to do both, whether it's calls, whether it's talks, whether it's focusing because I need two hours just to myself. So I think there'll need to be a balance of both. Um, I think the variety of kind of collaboration, furniture, etc., cetera, will, um, there'll be more of a variety. There'll be more of the kind of movable um, kind of clusters of spaces and things like that. Um, What we do is we kind of look at the building and what are the kind of quiet pockets of space and we try and put all the quiet furniture up in those quiet pockets and then close them off. And then there's a kind of noisier spaces and then the social spaces as well. Um, We've been working with clients as well, looking at um, how they kind of split departments across the space as well, because you come into the office to see you, the people who you, you work with. So how do you get that kind of togetherness, cohesiveness with your department if you just said you can work anywhere um, because it's unlikely you'll have individual desks moving forward. Although saying that, I'm going off on tangents here as well, like Peter. Um, but <laughs> there are some clients who are still looking at just one-to-one desking. They're just staying traditional. So again, completely different pair business. Um, and it's a lot about, our, from our point of view, our consultancy point of view, we're just uh, getting to know the client, engaging with them and trying to understand what will make their business work in the future. Okay. Uh, Peter, um, a question from Alan is bringing us back to your um what were you saying earlier on about having an office with access to facilities and stuff like that? Alan is asking, isn't this a great opportunity to inject life into city center office and commercial areas that are dead after work hours, repurposing the many buildings that are predicted to experience reduced occupancy with a greater advent of home working, creating more mixed use, vibrant communities, 15 minutes neighborhoods, which is something we talked about when we were discussing the build to rent sector a couple of months, a few months ago. With the preservation of truly affordable homes and the core of this regeneration, it's a very interesting question. Yeah, that's quite interesting. You take the build to rent um, side, we do, we do quite a lot of that as well. And obviously, <laughs> Before COVID, um, there was a move, if you like, towards the city centres before COVID in terms of residential, getting closer to the workplace. Um, and I think that sector, I mean, that, that's going to be interesting how that, that sector is going to evolve in the future, um, to be honest. Because what, be, <laughs> what you might be looking at is are you moving the residential to the amenity rather than the office. Um, and I think that's the interesting part of it. Um, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's that is quite challenging. I probably don't have a lot lot more to say on that one, Sarah. Actually, because yes, okay. I think okay. it's, I think that one is that one's a, an interesting question. Yeah, I think I think um, we would need to to look at uh, national, but more importantly, local governments uh, in terms of how you you look at rates, how they're assessed, uh, to actually enable um, the redevelopment. I mean, let's be honest, the high street was in dire straits uh, before any of this, and it's been made worse now through the pandemic. We've seen a pattern where people are obviously buying online. When you're buying online, it tends to be bigger businesses that you're buying from. But also a lot of people are buying locally. They're going to their local butchers, their bakers, and trying to help out with local businesses, which is great. How will, how does that now transfer back to, the, when I say the high street, not just small towns, small towns are maybe doing a little bit better, 
but back to the city high streets where you've got big retail environments and, and, and restaurants and things, how do they get back and recover? And the only way that can happen is if there's a complete change of attitude from the government. Yeah. Can I come back in there, actually? We, we, we are working on a couple of big, um, if you like, shopping centres, city centre shopping schemes, and they are looking at readaption, if you like, of their existing space. Um, now, previously, what we did is we put cinemas and restaurants and things in it, but they're, they're looking at, um, you know, kind of big kind of modifications um, to a couple of schemes. I can't really say what the schemes are, but in the city centre, um, they are looking you know, at big changes. <laughs> there, are two, there are two big schemes that potentially would, would change the landscape of a, of a city centre, if you like, um, in terms of um, ad, re -adapt, adapting those spaces to be something different. Um, so I think there is plans in place. Um, and as, as Michael says, I think it will be more about how planning and how the how that all goes through um, in terms of repurposing zones, mm. if you like, within cities. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. So, but there, there's definitely out there. That is definitely out there in terms mm -hmm. of that. The smaller the smaller retail units, I think, will go to more a few things like cafes and restaurants. I think that's the, but the larger mm. shopping facilities could be something completely different. I mean, there, there will definitely be a bounce when this is over mm -hmm. in terms of people wanting to get back out into the what was the real world and it'll be great but as, as one of the questions earlier on touched on it, it will balance out again eventually mm -hmm. Hazel, Ross is asking since um, you also have a background in residential um, any thoughts on how increased home working will change the design of our homes particularly in the mass housing spec builder sector um, well, I guess um, we're all realising how cabin fever it can be. And my house is fairly generous and I don't have kids, so I'm one of the very lucky ones. My husband and I have our own separate offices and it's luxury, wow. but at the same time, um, it can still get a bit cabin fever. So I think I, I can imagine in the city centres where you've maybe just got uh, your living space and then your bedroom space, it can be a bit, um, I guess claustrophobic so I, I think there has to be and I think there will be a change in the, the residential moving forward um, I, maybe more generous space making sure that there's study areas maybe mm. a bit more zoning in spaces as well so I find I use my I've got an open plan kind of living kitchen dining space and I find myself se separating that visually to kind of create my own little pockets of space at night time I sit here at lunchtime I sit at this table because the sun's coming in um, in the morning I sit here just so I've got that variety so there might be a bit more of the zonings of spaces as well and, and thinking a bit more about that. Does that answer the question? In any yeah, way? absolutely. And then Peter, Stephen is asking, who's more important, the architect or the MNE consultant? I think it's, we're all important. So, because <laughs> we right. have to work together to deliver the projects. And that's not just me just saying that. I, I mean, in essence, we, we need to do that. We need to work collaboratively um, and, and we, we have got the technical tools, if you like, to help architects understand from a sustainability perspective, you know, what their buildings are doing um, and to realise the vision that is that the architect or the interior designer creates uh, within this space. So we, we are, we're there to support the vision um, that's been presented to the client, um, but we all have to work. Everyone's is just as important as each other because you can't do it on your own. Uh, Michael, we have a question from Darren. Uh, do we think that there will be a shift in the type of occupier that we see in certain areas of cities, and will this change the type of lease agreements that are offered? Um, I think that, that's it's an interesting question. The, the type of occupiers, I, I'm not convinced they will change dramatically. Um, I think that uh, certain sectors will will. Uh, will increase in terms of their scale. You know, I think they'll become busier and some will contract, but that's got a lot to do with the general market conditions of the economy, I think, rather than just necessarily what we think we're doing with the pandemic and, and, and the real estate. The facilities that the, these businesses will require will, will differ, and that's when the likes of Hazel and Peter will obviously have to try and create space that, that can be all things to all people at the same time, which is virtually impossible, I suppose. Um, with leases, um, 
there was a lot said about leases when we were talking about co-working in the past and, and how they can be flexible and be recognised by institutions. I don't think that that will change dramatically. Um, I think that the 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 leases or the the lease environment is uh, matured enough and, and responsive enough to, to to meet people's requirements, and I don't think that that's going to necessarily be a, a big change after COVID. Thank you very much. And uh, Azor, back to you. Jen is asking: Have you have you experienced the pandemic as being a further drive of the BIM process across the sector as a result of people working from home and collaborating models independently? Uh, yeah, BIM at the moment and Revit and driving it from people's home. Um, the word that I hear the most at the moment is, can I sync? Um, so it's, <laughs> there's been a lot of clarity. Right, yeah. <laughs> the only one person can sync at a time, I've learned. So <laughs> um, there have been issues, obviously, not having the bandwidth at home and working, seven people working on the same model. Um, it's been a lot slower. Um, the kind of productivity there, I think, has been, and they have to collaborate to be able to, <laughs> to kind of work the model. Um, in terms of using 3D modeling um, as one of our tools, yeah, it's been, it's, we've totally rocketed ahead in the past year. Uh, we've been using things, I can't remember the name of the program, but basically we, you can kind of show the client around the building. We can yeah. send them a little app on their phone and be looking up and round and so it's like VR on the phone mm -hmm. and we found not just communicating with the clients from a distance but we find it useful communicating with the contractor this is our design intent and this is how we want it to look so this steelwork contractor this is how we how do we design to that so as a collaboration tool when you're not in the same space or you're not on site kind of looking up at things um, it's it's been a very important tool in this past year we've seen it um, grow leaps and bounds within the practice. So a couple of notes about Stephen's questions of earlier on. Kenny is, asked, Kenny is adding that we should not forget the CNS consultant and then Stephen replies that Peter is given the wrong answer, the right answer is Michael the developer. <laughs> And then we got Alan that notes that during his career, I have always appreciated the benefits of receiving help and advice from my more experienced peers. This is something we touched about today, but also in the chats we had before in preparation of this event. In my recent experience of lockdown, home working and video meetings make this mentoring of younger people much more difficult to facilitate. Mm -hmm. And I personally feel that this is one area of a future-based of a future based around increasing some working that is going to be difficult to address. By the way, being a Scot is great to feel a home to it today. So. Mm -hmm. I thought, um, Azel, this Azel and, and Peter and, and Michael, this is something you also mentioned during our chat, isn't it? Yeah, I think mentoring is um, something I'm really interesting and interested in, actually. Um, the BCO, I find that as well. So we've got a BCO mentoring programme too, which is up and running. Um, and I know um, Stephen, who is, who's on this, is one of the mentors as well. But we're finding that's really useful for the, the kind of younger ones across all the sectors. So I guess at the moment, they're not out and about there uh, networking. We'd be going to events, we'd be doing this um, in a building, we'd be doing this in the showroom, we'd be seeing each other and meeting new people. So I think that networking aspect is really tricky and seeing how different disciplines work um, and yeah. getting their perspective. So yeah, I think the BCO uh, mentoring program is a really good one to try and support that. But within our practice as well, um, we're finding um, as the more experienced people that you need to curate that a bit more again. So you need to make the effort to check in with people and say, yes. how are you doing today? And it's not just the blanket, how are you doing today? It's trying to ask the right questions to work out how are they feeling? Because they might just be, yeah, I'm fine. But you know, mm. deep down, um, we've been doing some mental uh, um, health awareness. I think Head Torch through in Glasgow are a really good company. And they came in and did some training with um, the directors, associates, um, and kind of things to look out for with your team. So I think we have to become more aware of it and be more kind of um, direct and as a kind of as a mentor, making sure that your, your team are fine, because they, they probably will just say that they are fine, but they might not be. So pick up on the signs. 
Uh, Michael, Stephen is asking, do you think that building owners and occupiers will truly invest in working environments when considering there was a credible measure between excellent work environments and staff retention? Well, yeah, I think that uh, data like that is always going to influence, you know, decisions that are made. You know, st staff retention, I think, was probably one of the biggest drivers for creating office environments with additional amenity space to make people feel that, uh, you know, the, the work or the office is a desirable place to go. I don't think that's going to change. I think that's still a, a massive aspect. Um, I think those spaces will, will evolve and be better than they were before. So like Hazel said before, it maybe just kicks us on a little bit. And the, the decisions that were perhaps just getting made by finance directors in the past will now have a, a degree of HR involved in understanding in terms of, of, of what the operations managers feel is required for their staff. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think that, um, I don't think it's, you know, throwing the baby out of the bathwater or anything like that. I just think that it's space being used slightly differently. It will be configured slightly differently for investors. Will that have a huge impact on how much it will cost them to buy an asset? I don't think it will. I think that we will probably just have changes, slight changes in base build design that creates as much flexibility in the future as possible. And selling that to a fund, hopefully, uh, as, a, as a principal, shouldn't, shouldn't be too difficult if they've got indeed an ESG um, policy or, 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 or a statement in place. Thank you very much. So I'm aware of time, so I'll probably just go for the last question and Peter or as a matter of fact, Hazel and Michael as well. But Alice is asking, how can sustainability be a fundamental or leading element in future-proofing workplace design? I, th I think we've all, I think we've all sort of grown to realise, if you like, through this pandemic, that sustainability is extremely important. As I say, I don't think I've ever been asked uh, is to, to carry out as many presentations on, if you like, sustainability as I have done in lockdown. Um, and it's been great because we've been, it's been everyone, you know, from project managers, architects, clients, um, you know, everyone is really interested. And one of the other big things that we've been doing in terms of sustainability is climate change assessments mm -hmm. and looking at how climate change could affect things. So there's this kind of, I feel like, evolving, you know, the sustainability statement is quite a big kind of broad brush statement. And people think, you know, like recycling is that's what sustainability is. But mm -hmm. Sustainability is about something that, that when we create it, we can reuse it, we can readapt. We, we have things that, that we, we are not using lots and lots of natural resources. Um, and that's, that's been a big, a big focus on us. And as, as, as Michael alluded to, um, in terms of without giving away trade secrets and stuff, you know, the approach to how we design buildings has got to fundamentally change. It's got to fundamentally change. Legislation is driving us that way as well. You know, there, there's, a, there's a working session I was supposed to be in today on the new building regulations, which is actually how, driving towards, if you like, how we get to the net zero carbon targets of 2050. Mm -hmm. And our, our networks, our electrical networks, if we go all, all electric buildings are gonna be negative carbon between 2030 and 2035. So we will find ourselves looking at from an energy and a carbon perspective, you know, we're, we're on that, we're on that trajectory at the moment and we're on an exponential, um, if you like, um, pathway at the moment as well, because um, I think we've all sort of realised that things like COVID, um, you know, start to make people think about, you know, life in general. And yeah. when you start to think about life, sustainability is, is at the core. So yeah. it's another long-winded answer. But I think that, that there's a moral and social uh, awareness and responsibility that in the past, sustainability was was a box to tick, whereas people believe it now and, and, and they're living it. And that's that's absolutely the right thing. And it has to be the way forward. We shouldn't be waiting on legislation to, to tell us what to do. You know, as as the designers, as the, the experts in the industry, we should be leading the, the charge on these things. And um, as a developer, the incentive for that is if you've got a space that's doing these things and your competitors don't, then that's attraction in itself because the occupiers, they're expecting these things. So you need to give them them. Yeah, all of a sudden, all, all this becomes very tangible, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a great time for innovation. That's the thing. It's a great time to, be, to, to innovate. <laughs> Which is interesting because, yeah, you know, the, the I think you'd said it before in the past, Hazel, about, you know, necessity uh, creates creates the opportunity to, to be inventive, um, to create innovation. What we, uh, we have now, though, is people working from home, 
a lot of people aren't delegating properly. So if you're a, a, perhaps early on in your career, your opportunity to get a piece of work to, to then be sort of informally monitored and in how you do that work, that starts to get lost. And people are scared to be in an environment like this, uh, which is formal, and ask difficult questions like, actually, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, can you help me? It all becomes a, a, a little bit forced. So, you know, someone had asked a question earlier on about uh, mentoring and, and development. I actually think that's one of the biggest risks right now um, because I know personally when I started working and even now actually, you, you don't go and ask the one person all of your questions, you spread them around and that's going to be really difficult in this sort of, uh, you know, no one-to-ones, no informal uh, development in education. Right, on that note, uh, thank you very much, Azel, Michael and Peter. This is really good fun and very, very interesting. Thank you for your time and thank you for accepting our invitation to join in today. Uh, thank you, as usual, to our sponsor, Domus, that keeps us going in these very difficult times. And we'll be back on the 22nd of April and we'll be talking about how architecture can sustain and help and support our physical health. And we're going to have speakers from BDP Architects, There Is Light Consultants, University of Stockholm and Glasgow School of Art. So hope to see you there and thank you very much for your time and your very good questions. See you then. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.